everybody. Uh, we have a great week of programming for Let's Do Lunch. Uh, as everybody knows, this is our season two, and we are actually coming to an end of season two. This is our last week before we take a little little break before we will we will start uh, season three. Um, let me remind everybody that we love to know who's here and to get you guys going in the chat. So please introduce yourself in the chat. And when you do that, make sure to change the drop down to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your posts. And if you have questions during the panel today, put them in the Q&A button just to the left of the chat on the bottom nav. Um, as Monday always is, it is our business of streaming day. And as a reminder that streaming truly is a global business, today's topic is culture matters. And we have a fantastic guest with us today to uh, have a discussion about uh, global content and the importance of cultural adaptations. Uh, Teresa Phillips is CEO of Spirix. Welcome, Teresa. Hi, Ned. Happy to be here. Great to have you on the show. And our host, Colin Dixon. Welcome, Colin. Colin is CEO and Chief Analyst of M Screen Media. Thanks, Ned. I'm so glad to hear that we got renewed for a third season. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're in the third season, does that mean I get my agent to negotiate a higher fees? Well, well let's, let's talk off, off camera about that. <laughs> All right. Great show, guys. Have a great day. Thank, thank you, Ned. Thank you. Um, uh, Teresa, welcome. So happy you're here. We've spoken before and I was I was just so excited when we got you to, to, to join us here on Let's Do Lunch. Um, so why don't we start off, uh, tell us a little bit about Spherex and then um, we'll, we'll dive into the conversation. Great, thanks. Yeah, good to see you again, Colin. So uh, Spherex uh, is a company, we're a B2B company, we're in the media and entertainment industry exclusively and we help uh, everyone from Content providers and distributors and streamers help them, streaming platforms, help them culture fit their content to almost 250 countries and territories around the world. So this is a, I, I guess, I, what I should say is a pretty unusual, though it's very timely focus for your company. What, how did you end up there? This is a very interesting place to end up. Yeah, well, it's, you know, I've worked in media, at the intersection of media and technology for a couple of decades. And so, um, you know, with uh, I've always had an interest in culture. And so with uh, OTT and streamers having to distribute uh, internationally, it was an opportunity for me to kind of blend my background and interests with technology. And, and uh, our team uh, had, you know, a lot of deep domain expertise around metadata and internationalization. So it was just a great fit. So uh, I think um, maybe you should talk a little bit about how um, you go about uh, with building the cultural database and th that general approach. Um, and this database, um, really, it's, it's fascinating. I think it's probably unique in the industry. So I really, tell us a little bit about how you create that database and then we'll talk about how you go about using it. Sure, so, so there's, uh, you know, we talk about uh, listings, uh, cultural listings being you know, typical metadata, uh, local titles, uh, the artwork, the trailers associated with them. And so up until now, uh, we as an industry have localized, meaning we've adapted content to a particular region. So mostly the language through audio dubs and subtitles uh, and you know, local art, uh, but we didn't really culturalize. So culturalize means adapting the content to the viewer, uh, one's culture. So that's independent of a fixed geography. Uh, it can be, that dimension can be attached to the content, of course, to figure out what content is more uh, culturally similar, as well as to the viewer, you know, what is their primary culture. So we have for a number of years, um, and working in, in metadata and with listings, we've been able to acquire a database of about 25 million uh, global titles and are able to, what we call culturalize those, uh, make them uh, appropriate for various cultures around the world. Uh, so very timely product. I, I know this has been in the in the works for a long time, but as you as you mentioned up front, big globalization move among many of the services out there. So I think it's probably fair to say that it's been a busy time for Spherex. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially with the pandemic, right? With uh, home entertainment, home entertainment being up, you know, thirty percent. So it's 
One of those were all boats rise. Um, and so we've been a beneficiary of that. Uh, but just with the enormous amount of content, tens of billions of dollars being spent on uh, original content by the big streaming platforms. There's a lot of consolidation, as you know, in our industry. And then just with the you know, enormous growth of consumer subscribers worldwide, we're gonna be at like 2 billion uh, in the next few years. So it's just exploding. Right, so, so I think as you mentioned, we're, we're probably all familiar with internationalization, but much less familiar with culturalization. So perhaps you can sort of walk us through what, why it's needed, and then we can talk about how you go about doing it. Sure. Well, so, so kind of culture is our operating system, right? So it, it, it controls how we think, how we express our emotions, how we communicate, how we behave. And so every experience we have comes through our cultural filter, right? And so it's, you know, a classic communication when somebody uh, wants to communicate, they, you know, have a message, they encode it, and then the receiver of that message then decodes it and then, you know, interprets it, right? And they interpret it through their own cultural lens. And so if you have a, a story or movie or TV show uh, and you don't have uh, the context right, or if you don't have, um, you're not using props and things that have meaning, uh, you could either lose your audience altogether or you could offend them, or you could, um, you could create, you know, controversy. Like as an example, I was just reading this week in Ghana, there was um, the, the regulator put out uh, and said anybody who submits a title without preview would be subject to up to five years imprisonment. And the reason is that um, these two 10 year olds uh, supposedly or allegedly killed uh, somebody else, another teenager over money rituals. So they'd watched this TV show on get rich quick, how did these get rich quick schemes. And so what we often forget is that uh, here in the US is that we know this is entertainment, right? We understand it. We've been watching um, movies and TVs for decades and decades. And now with OTT, it's just in the last five years or so with mobile and broadband capacity that a lot of these countries are able to watch content worldwide. And so we just have to be mindful about how we might perpetuate stereotypes or how we might explore, exploit minorities and just be culturally sensitive. Right, and I, I remember when Netflix first announced it was going global it was actually quite quickly banned in a couple of regions. I think one, one was Indonesia and I forget where the other one was. And it was because basically they were bringing content into that culture that yeah. just was a very, very poor fit. Um, so, so how do you go about help company, helping companies not make that mistake? Sure. Well, we started out with uh, what's called content classification. So it's determining the appropriate audience suitability or age rating for a title. So just like in the US where we have, say the MPAA, where we have, you know, G, PG, PG-13, rated R, et cetera. Um, many countries around the world, about 50 to 60 have their own classification systems. Now, the classification systems vary, you know, considerably across culture. In some cases, like in the Middle East, there might be some a title suitable for everyone or age 16 or 18, right? There's not a lot of levels. In other countries like Europe and France, it might go age 10, 12, 14, 16. And then underneath those, uh, you know, the classifications, the age classifications are what we call classifiable elements that's also unique to each culture. And it's things like, um, you know, bullying, uh, violence, uh, sexuality, nudity, profanity, all those kinds of things. And it, it differs quite a lot what's acceptable and not acceptable across cultures. And so it, 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 it is um, it's, it's pretty difficult. What we did, how we started was uh, we kind of data mined all the uh, legislation and child exploitation laws and countries where there was explicit uh, guidance and laws and policies. Um, and then we also, um, you know, we listened to all kinds of uh, tapes and, and everything. And then uh, we created this, uh, our own taxonomy and dictionary around culture. And we codified that and then ultimately embedded it in systems because we knew that um, humans alone couldn't do this at scale. And so that was kind of what we set out to do. But it was a Herculean task, not only because a lot of these customs and laws were written decades ago and didn't anticipate, you know, uh, access mediums like mobile and OTT and things. It was written for film exhibition or for broadcast television. So we had to kind of make allowances for that in this new environment. Um, but yeah, that's how we got started. And, and this is 
a perfect uh, use case for technology because it, it is a classification system, right? So there is a right answer, uh, except for the countries where they censor, of course, meaning you have to edit the content. But that's how we got started and, and have evolved quite a lot since then. So um, g give me an example of how you worked with a company to get things right. I think I remember you telling me one about it took like two or three different attempts to get something past the sensor. Do you remember, do yeah. you remember that example? Well, when we, so when we started, we were working with studios and submitting uh, titles for theatrical release. So we worked with about 20 different um, regulators worldwide and they were experiencing an influx of content on streaming devices, right? And so many of them uh, either didn't have the staff, didn't have the technology uh, to be able to keep up. And so we were able to uh, negotiate with them to allow us to kind of write on their behalf or, you know, uh, ensure them that we could, you know, that, that we were, we, we would thoughtfully consider their rules and things. And so they uh, gave us that permission to do so. Uh, and then there are others that just can't keep up, right? Um, but yeah, we have worked over time with a lot of the big streaming platforms to help them do compliance edits. And we work with the regulators, um, you know, to, to, to on advisement around things like, you know, again, sexuality and violence and help them make uh, informed decisions around what they should edit to get their uh, the appropriate age for that territory. Right. Now, um, we tend to think that uh, content that's good here is good everywhere. Um, but it turns out, uh, as your as your database shows, that individual regions have very, very different um, values inbuilt into them. And that means that you can bring content from here to somewhere else and it really does fall afoul. And and it's very difficult to keep up with this. You, you, you talked about an example in New Zealand. You mentioned, I think you mentioned it in the opening about bullying. Um, just, just walk us through what's going on there and how that would impact content that may be made in the US, but is part of a US service that's available in New Zealand. Because it is, it is an Engli English language speaking country. So very accessible. Right. Yeah. So, so in our business, uh, context is everything. So we call the content, you know, we look at the content, which is the what, we look at the context, which is the, you know, kind of the who, why, uh, when and how. And then we look at the structure, which is the relationship of all this, all these different things, right? And so context is, is really, really important. Um, to just see a couple examples, like you mentioned, um, New Zealand, the New Zealand regulator, uh, they and the UK and Australia and a lot of countries do ongoing uh, studies with their consumers on sentiment analysis to see how their attitudes might be evolving around things like, you know, with the youth around things like uh, sexuality and whatnot. And, or also they deal with issues that they might be facing in their society. So in New Zealand, there's a youth epidemic of self-harm. And so they're very, very sensitive to any notion of, of bullying, self-harm, or mention of suicide and it requires uh, a lot of ongoing adv advisories, on-screen advisories and, and additional support. And so uh, just recently, for example, uh, they updated their rules uh, to account for some of the information they learned in these studies. And uh, just as an example, they learned that there was a correlation uh, between, you know, kind of a trigger and then the context of a school setting around um, tattoos and, and, or I should say body art and eating disorders. So now we'll start, start having to check for that. Uh, for specifically for New Zealand, we've had to change our rules to say, is there a school setting? Is there, is there any body art? Is there bul bulimia or any other eating disorder? And there's just lots of examples like that that are, that are happening all the time. So, uh as a content creator or content aggregator and, and distributor, when is the best time for me to work with SphereX to figure these issues out? And uh, it, it sounds, actually from your description, it sounds like it's an ongoing process, but, but maybe a good place to start is, when is the best time for me to engage with SphereX to check my content or, you know, when is that, when is the right time? Sure. Yeah, so you know, it is, it, it's evolving. It's kind of like pay now or pay later, right? Uh, just like if you think about the, the area of uh, in software development, QA automation, you know, if you can, the earlier you detect a bug in the product, the more likely it is that, you, that it won't, you know, propagate. 
Same thing here, the earlier in the production cycle that you start to account for culture and how it might be received or interpreted, the, the, the faster time to market, the less, the fewer number of edits you have to make and obviously it helps keep your brand safer. So in some clients we work as early as a script, um, others as a kind of a, a scene that might be cut, a cut scene. And you know we call that content analysis. We have a new product called Greenlight that actually will, it looks at all the, an early release and will timestamp different cultural sensitivities. And so what we have in, um, you know, I'd mentioned that we've gone quite farther than classification. So we have this concept uh, of culture mixing and we look at uh, cultural proximity or distance between cultures when we advise our clients and help them know that, um, you know, these cultural artifacts, whether they might be religious or an event or a behavior or something, uh, and where it's going in another culture and how that might be received, if it's complementary or if it's uh, conflicting or it might contaminate the culture, things like that. So the earlier the better. Uh, most of the time we work with them in post-production and in distribution, obviously. So if I'm working with you in pre-production -pre or during a production process, you can give me a sort of itemized list of, look, these things that you say you're gonna, you know, you're releasing here and in, in these regions. Um, here's an itemized list of things that we think would be problematic. So I have an opportunity then to maybe reshoot a different version of that scene or, or handle it a little better. That's correct. What do I, what, what do, I do about um, library titles? What are my options there? So first of all, how do you go about detecting what's going on in those library titles? Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about fixing them. Sure. Yeah, so, so you're right. We just talked about original content uh, where we screen that. Uh, library titles are characterized by titles that have already been out in a market, one or more markets for some period of time. And so what we, we have are market signals, right? And in that case, it's mostly distributors or streaming platforms that are uh, relicensing these titles from say the UK, and they might be going to Australia or into the US or other uh, any other country. And so then we have, we use the same set of algorithms that we've originated using our content classification system uh, for original content. And we data mine uh, market signals. So we'll look at, you know, in country, uh, we'll look at, you know, user reviews and all kinds of anything that's been written about those titles. And then uh, we can, you know, use our, apply our algorithms to be able to data mine the appropriate age rating for them. Okay. And, and so once I've identified these, what are my options? I mean, I've I just got to start putting beeps in or <laughs> how do yeah. I handle them? Yeah. In the library One of the titles. things. One other thing, remember that uh, this is also where our large catalog comes into play. We just did a, a big backfill project for one of the streamers and we had, you know, tens of thousands of titles and we ended up, and it was for like 19 or 22 countries worldwide, we ended up having 82 to 84 percent of those titles in our database already, the local ratings and everything. So that's, um, so that's, that, that allows us to, a lot of information that allows us to then data mine for new territories. Um, so then, um, I'm sorry, I just lost track of your question. What was? So, um, what, what can, how do you advise people to fix the problems fix in those things, library right. titles that have already, already been shot? Yeah, so the, so the Greenlight product um, is really, a, it helps them look region by region or helps them understand, you know, the fewest number, they, fewest number of edits they can make to reach the largest audience, right? So we apply demographics to it as well. And so where do they get the biggest bang for their buck? Um, they also have uh, top markets, you know, top 25 markets that they care about. And so we can advise on uh, not only the different events that they can um, edit, but also, you know, just, just let them know each country, whether it's a close up of a, of a camera that they need to change or what it is that they change to pass that hurdle to get that uh, target age rating. But ultimately it's a business decision as to what changes they make, unless it's a censorship country, of course, where they might be banned. Right, right. But is this a long process? Is the analysis of the of the material a long process? No, not at all. I mean, our, our we have standard SLAs, of course. Um, you know, but uh, but yeah, we've we've done kind of near real time assessments for, you know, concerts and things of that nature. So um, we, we can we can pretty much turn around, turn these around pretty quickly. Wow. So you can catch wardrobe malfunctions and. <laughs> So it's that, that type of thing that, uh, or maybe even costumes. So what are you analyzing there? It's really interesting. What are we analyzing? Yeah, in, in the real time. 
So it, so there's it, it depends on the the media. Sometimes it's a it's an interview, right? Um, a celebrity interview. Other times it could be a, a music video, and other times it could be a live uh, event, a uh, live sport event or something. And so those are kind of near real time that have a, or a lot of things are event driven. If something happens in the world and one of our clients might want to get that out quickly, uh, then you know there's really fast turnaround in terms of um, you know understanding the efficacy of the of the title worldwide. So when you come back uh, with recommendations. Uh, are they, um, this is this is just, I hope this is interesting to the audience. I know this is very interesting to me, but do, do you grade, do you sort of give um, a grading like this is an absolute no, no, um, this looks problematic, this could trigger a, a problem? Is that is that the way it's sort of an ABC ranking or something like that? So in, in countries that have um, classification systems, it's generally uh, each of these events will rate according to the age. And so a lot of times, uh, you know, providers will want, they'll want their title to hit an equivalent of, say, a PG-13 or a TV-14 level audience worldwide. And so they, they're able to then, um, we have all these classification systems worldwide normalized into audience demographic bands. And so we have like kids, young adults, uh, teens, et cetera. So they choose their target audience. And then above that horizontal threshold, pop up all the events and they have a lot of just information about it. Now for countries that have kind of a binary go, no go, like China, what we do is uh, we apply kind of the modifiers around a, a risk. So we'll say, you know, it's, you know, moderate risk or, you know, high risk. And then we have what we believe is the line that would have, something would be banned fully. Wow. So, man, I don't know how you keep up with China. That seems to yeah. be a constantly evolving market. Yeah. Well, you know, China is interesting. We're just starting to do China, by the way, but, um, What's interesting about China, but also a lot of other countries is, you know, even though they may have explicit uh, rules and laws on the books, uh, they may or may not practice those laws consistently. And then also there's catch-alls like, you know, um, you know, the, the, you know, defying moral order or, you know, putting the state in a bad light. So there's this catch-all bucket. And it's something funny you were talking about earlier with um, culture being so different. Um, I was remembering in Titanic, China actually, uh, the nudity where Jack's painting, you know, you remember painting the picture of Rose and the Titanic? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, China censored that. And it was the 3D version they censored, you know, they censored both of them, but for the 3D version specifically, they censored because they said, you know, the um, people's hands might reach out to touch it, to touch, and it would distract other viewers in the, in the theater. So they said, we're getting rid of the nudity. <laughs> so, so there's just a lot of, you never know what, what people are going to come up with, and uh, we just have to deal with it and adjust. Uh, but yeah, there's an ongoing debate in our office about when do we change a rule? If a rule has been kind of, you know, um, you know not consistently applied, you know, when do we actually change the system as opposed to, you know, training the humans around the judgment and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to drop in a quick question from Ellie, Ellie McNeil. Thank you for entering your question in the Q&A window, Ellie. She wondered, she, you, you said about real-time processing. She's asking about the latency in that process, that processing. How, are you, how far behind the real-time can you be? Well, it's, again, it depends on, it depends on, you know, what it is. And because if it's not uh, required to be near real-time coming out, then, um, then you know we'll usually have an hour or two, right? Uh, and that, but that's also the dependency on our our client. But but generally, you know, we can uh, we can turn around a title and rating it. Uh, I would say like two x the runtime. And so if it's say an hour event, then in two hours, if you know we're focused on it, uh, we can turn it around. Okay. Okay. So it's, so it's more for replay of the event than the than censoring mm. in real time. No, no, we're censoring it in real time, but it takes us a, like an hour afterwards to just make sure that for if oh, like, I see. Well, this is for worldwide distribution, right? So yeah. we have to make sure that you know everything's properly accounted for and classified, cool. uh, and then and then we got to package it and we got to send it through XML or however we do that. So yeah, you know, it, it varies. Got it. Got it. Um, so one of the things that you are using in the back back end is. Um, is AI and machine learning. Um, talk to us about how you're using that. I think you're using it in a couple of different ways, right? 
Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we started using ML in our um, machine learning and our you know, systems from uh, like catalog content, right? Uh, so that our, our systems could get better. But then specifically for AI, uh, we have a multimodal AI system and we initially developed it to accelerate this um, content screening because we're the only commercial providers of local age ratings, right? And worldwide, I mean, the regulators are doing it and we have a vision of, of being able to uh, kind of decentralize it. And because it is a regulated, content's regulated, allowing third parties to use our tools or local regulators to you know, have decentralized workforce and things. And we knew that uh, we needed to scale it. Uh, so uh, we created a multimodal AI system. So we account for uh, the audio. Uh, so it looks at you know, the music, uh, the sound effects, the tempo, the pitch, all those things and analyzes it. And so like, if you think about JAWS, for instance, like, boom, 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 boom. so we know when something's gonna be coming, right? <laughs> so, um, as it turns out, you know, the, the, the same musical composers score a lot of the, 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 the Hollywood movies. And so they use kind of the same musical composition to evoke similar emotions in us, you know, as drones sitting there watching movies. So whether it's, you know, humor or anger or suspense, our system can detect what the what the pattern is of that music and then we can kind of predict what that emotion is the anticipated emotion and um and then we also have learned like what they'll do is they'll replay the same set of chords uh when they're trying to do flashbacks and things like that to evoke like nostalgia and stuff um so that is that's kind of music and then we also use uh computer vision to look at the video and then we use um nlp natural language processing to look at text and and also which is the dialogue but it also includes the props like the doorbell ringing dog barking things and then we uh, combine all those three things because that's really where context comes in uh, so that we can then uh, use that uh, to to predict what the events are to predict the scenes to understand the context around those scenes and so that's that's what we uh, developed so um, how can we use this this uh, database that you've created you created. Um, it seems to me like it's a, it's tapping into something that's very much a problem right now. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of cultural sensitivity going on in all, all parts of our industry. So how can we take your database and your rating system and your cultural identity system? How do you, how can this best be used in the industry right now? Yeah. So I think, you know, uh, going forward, it's about, like we talked, started with culturalized listings. So the, you know, I call them exhaust products, but one of the exhausts or the benefits of this AI system we built, which wasn't planned, was it creates a unique digital signature. So we started to, um, we started to see the AI engine uh, start to score these titles. And then we started, um, said, okay, let's extract uh, the, the, the kind of the signature and then it generated trailers for us. And so the trailer wasn't intended to be promotional. So it's not like three minutes or two minutes. Some of them are five, some of them are eight. But when you look at them, it's at, it was actually extracting and identifying the key cultural artifacts and the theme for each of these titles. And then with that, we were able to create a digital signature. And so, in, and then of course you can cluster titles now, similar titles. So all that feeds back into our big database, right, of titles. So the goal is that in the future, we'll have a, a, a very large cultural a, a database of culturalized listings where the artwork is specifically chosen for that culture, where the trailer is, is generated for that culture, and where each of those titles will have its own digital signature so streaming platforms can improve content discovery around the world. It seems like we're sort of at a very rudimentary stage in handling this type of thing. I remember Netflix a couple of years ago got into trouble because some young woman said that their their system was racist because it was pushing right. pictures that were um, culturally the same as her, but not necessarily relevant to the movie uh, mm -hmm. at her. So, uh, this is this the type of thing that you're you can really help us out with and, and do a better job with? Yeah, and you're right. There's a you know speaking of Netflix, there's a really good documentary uh, called Coded Bias. And so it explains all that, um, how, how bias can be built into these systems uh, unintentionally or intentionally, I don't know which. But um, 
so you're right. What we do is uh, our AI system has been largely built on, or the, 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 the training data is really important. And the exhaust from our ratings, uh, we did ratings by humans. And we still do actually, because this is a really hard problem to solve. Context is really difficult. So we are able to feed our, uh, train our AI engine using things that humans have um, judged. And so, um, you know, machines will do whatever you train it to do. And if you don't identify the nuance in it, then it, will, it won't capture it. And uh, so we're very careful about making sure we understand what contributes to a rating and the specifics of it, maybe not what's just happening in the foreground, but even what's happening in the background. And so that as our, we train our system, it starts picking up all these things, not just the main thing. And um, it, is a, it is a problem. Everybody faces it with AI and ML, but I think it, it, um, you know, it, it depends on your training, your training data. Are, are there some cultural issues that are more, much more difficult to handle than others? I mean, um, I'm thinking like nudity. Yeah, there's definitely different attitudes towards nudity. But there are other things that are maybe more subtle, like LGBTQ issues. Uh, I, I mean, talk us through. Are there some areas that are just really, really hard? Well, it's so there's two things, right? Uh, yes, definitely. Each country has its own um sensitivities uh both in terms of you know uh the the region but also in terms of the state you know and so this the state uh whether it's india china indonesia they're trying to achieve both growth uh for their country and control of the media and so this is a fine line that they walk and um it is quite different than it is here as far as our ai engine if that's if that's what you're asking is that um yeah, so when we train it, things are definitely easier than others. So profanity is pretty easy uh, because we can have a dictionary with profane and slang words. It's a little bit harder when you're talking about international because we're learning the colloquialisms and slang and, and local language and then having to, you know, change it to English and things. And so, you know, they don't make sense to us a lot of times, um, but, uh, but, but it's still pretty easy. But if you do like LGBTQ, you mentioned is is uh, was one of the harder ones to train for our machine our system because um, for a couple reasons. One in in um, later you know later society like more recent films, uh, detecting gender is harder than it, it used to be in some decades past and in some countries where there's this movement towards maybe more you know um, gender neutral or androgyny. But I think more importantly is that uh, the LGBTQ community, and not just that, any community really where there is, uh, where they've kind of, uh, like the prohibition days or anything where they've lived in secret, there's, uh, there's kind of code, code language, if you will, you know, like um, coming out of the closet maybe. So it's double entendre. So if they say, you know, this is my partner or coming out of the closet or uh, on the same team or these kinds of things that according to you know our regular NLP it doesn't pick that up necessarily so it, it is more difficult to train yes now I'd like to spend a, just a couple of minutes talking about future issues one of the things you said as we were going as we as we were moving through is you mentioned something about generating trailers automatically yeah. cultural trailers tell us a little bit about a little bit more about that yeah so I mean I think um, all of this, well, if, if you look at the number one problem is today, and it's going to be for the next 10 years or foreseeable future is content discovery, right? And especially when you're looking at uh, now, just like less than it's like 5% of content is distributed globally. It's just a very, very small um, percentage of content. And if you look at the fact that growth by the streaming platforms, global platforms, is going to have to come from outside the U.S. in the next five years. I mean, they've reached saturation for the most part in the U.S. And then you also have countries that produce a lot of content, you know, whether it's Korea or India or Nigeria, a lot of them are now starting to distribute globally because they have the means to do so. Um, and so with, with this, with, with content, you know, um, being produced globally and being, you know, syndicated simultaneously, We've got to have find ways to uh, localize and culturalize content, and uh, using AI to create trailers um, that are targeted to, towards a specific culture will not only help people find content better, but we believe it'll also help increase engagement. Very good. And and um, timelines. It seems like timelines are always getting shorter and shorter. 
Um, and yeah. actually the, the um, creation timeline is changing pretty radically because of people, you know, dropping all the episodes at once. Um, is that a problem for culturalization? Um, well, I think, it, I think we have to think about it differently, right? So what we tend to do with evolution and technology is we tend to, you know, apply the same uh, ways of doing with the new technology and that doesn't work, like moving pictures and things like that. Um, so I think that, um, you know, of course I don't know, just, I just think, spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff and have for some time. And, but um, I think that it's gonna be more, we have to do more adaptation uh, than what we do today, but it, it can't be in the same way that we license today. So in the, in the theatrical business and even in streaming for that matter, uh, they option or they license content to other uh, countries for remix or adaptation, local ad adaptations. Well, I still think that's going to happen, uh, but I think it's going to be, we have to figure out how to templatize it almost and so that these adaptations can happen in parallel to the main uh, title. And so, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why I think that. One of them is that, um, you know, when I was in the service, um, in the service many, many moons ago, um, I was there serving at NATO during a, an incredible period of history, which was the ending of the Cold War. And two things, I mean, a lot of it, you know, uh, affected me obviously and, and informed kind of how I think, but two things that are relevant to this. One is when the Berlin Wall came down um, and we were able to, as GIs, were able to go to the, you know, they, they flooded, you know, East flooded West Germany. And then we were able to go to countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia. It was still Czechoslovakia back then. And um, two things, one is that, um, they were handed out at the bus stations and the train depots and things. They were uh, the people handing things out, and they were Harlequin romance novels. And that, and if you remember Harlequin romance, I remember when they cost twenty five cents, you know, at the at the grocery store. And I think they started in the UK. But um, but anyway, they had they figured out a way to do what they called back then trans editing. But they basically created a narrative, and then they allowed uh, for regional editors to basically swap out characters, their clothing, their props, their horse, their chariot, you know, it still had the same guy gets girl, girl gets guy, happy ending, but it was, it was very much localized, right? And, um, and then if you think, if you fast forward there a little bit, um, and you look at like telenovelas, which are, you know, Latin American soap or soap operas, and, and you look at the format and TV over the decades that has really been successfully adapted, it's been you know, the unscripted programming. It's been the, you know, the soap operas to some extent, the game shows, the reality TV, and they're completely localized. They're licensed, but they're completely localized, you know, like, um, you know, to, for, for culture and whatnot. And so I think that that's the same thing that's gonna happen with, with streaming platforms is that they will have to be localized. Uh, cult they'll have to be culturalized. Uh, but it can't be uh, this linear path of optioning and licensing. We'll have to figure out, we'll have to apply technology to figure out what are the cultural artifacts in each of these, um, you know, shows that might be problematic culturally, and then how we can address those uh, in regions. And the, the last thing I'll say about that, which is another part that's pushing that forward, is uh, if you look at Europe, for instance, with the AVMS, which is the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, AMSD, you know, it's new. It's a new law there that you know they've already instituted the thirty percent quota has to come. You know, every platform has to have thirty percent of their of their platform and local content. But now they're instituting like, you know, twenty five percent of the revenue has to be you know spent in in lo using local talent. And you got countries like Indonesia where the local retailers are saying there's not a level playing field with these. You know, and they're just pushing their own governments to uh, to draw a line. So there's a lot of push and pull and um, a lot of new energy around getting local talent. So I think that's kind of what's gonna happen. Adaptations, but, but done, uh, instigated by technology. Yeah, so. I, I, this, uh, <laughs> this, this new European rule, I'm not sure it's gonna have the desired effect. I think it's having uh, other problems, it's causing other problems in the European market. Um, but anyway, I think we're, we're just about ready to go to audience q and I want to make sure we get those questions in. So if you have a question for Teresa, please enter it in the Q&A window right now. And Laura, why don't we stick up the poll and while you're thinking about your question and listening to us discussing the questions, why don't you fill out our poll? Uh, it's, we're on a few subjects that we've talked about this morning. 
Um, so I think let's let's try Adriana Adriana Shaw. She's asking, is it different to work on documentaries than narratives? Is there a, is there a big difference between genre types? I would imagine. There's a difference. Right. Well, there, there's a difference in that uh, in many countries, uh, documentaries are not classifiable, meaning uh, they don't have to have an actual age rating. Um, and then also, where in countries where they are required to have age ratings, they're a lot more um, tolerant of things when it's because it's demonstrated as educational and documentaries generally aren't, you know, they're not, um, you know, excessive or, or explicit uh, for the most part. So yeah, they are treated differently. Okay. Um, and another question from Ellie McNeil. I think we covered some of this, but it might be good to reiterate. You, um, do you ever experience technical challenges when localizing content, perhaps missing assets? limit when edits are feasible? What about music licensing? Do you also review those types of decisions? So I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the whole question, but... Um, so well, why don't we start with the first part? Do you ever experience technical challenges when localizing content? What sort of things trip you up? Yeah, so, so remember, we don't, we don't localize the content. Uh, we advise, we assign we screen. Sorry, yeah, I, I, I think she meant culturalizing. When you're when you're looking at the cultural aspects yeah. of, the, of the of the content, do we encounter issues? Yeah. What sort of technical we, challenges do you run into? Well, technical technical not so much, um, but definitely interpretive challenges. And you know, like I said before, the countries a lot of times will have a uh, a, a ruling on something, but they don't apply that ruling consistently, and so we'll have to look at more recent. Um, you know, kind of like case law, if you will, uh, of evidence. But yeah, there's always challenges in terms of interpretation. Uh, a lot of a lot of edge cases, but not so much technical. And one of the things about this is it can be an iterative process, right? Um, you gave a great example, I think, in Indi Indonesia. I think it was Indonesia, with one particular scene where there was a couple and a fruit bowl in the background. And uh, talk talk us yeah. through that. That was, that's, that's a very interesting example. Yeah, so with, with one client in Indonesia, um, they have a, a law about, you know, public display of affection and then excessive affection. And so it took us a few edits to, you know, remove the third person from the scene while this couple was, there was some spontaneous affection. And so the couple, so the other people that were in the room had to leave and then- Why, why, was, the, why was that? What was, what was going on there? It's, it's public display of affection. Oh, so, I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah. So you can't, it can't be, it has to be private. So- and uh, so they had to remove, we had to remove the people from the scene and then uh, they deemed that one of the kisses was too excessive. That was excessive display of affection. So our client was like, well, how long can the kiss be? And we're like, we don't know. We just said that it's excessive. And then we had to remove all these additional props um, out, of the, out of the scene um, that, that, you know, that they didn't look kindly upon. So it became quite a, a pretty innocent uh, treatment in the end. And that included a banana in a fruit bowl, fruit bowl, right? fruit bowl, yes, <laughs> fruit bowl had to go. Oh my goodness. Well, it sounds like the need for Sphere Access Service is only going to increase with the increase in globali globalization, Teresa. So I think you've probably got a pretty safe business going forward for the next <laughs> few years at least, uh, particularly with the amount of content that's being produced. Um, so why don't we take a look at the at the poll, Laura, if you could take the poll down and then let's take a look at the poll answers. Okay, so I asked how many foreign non-English movies or shows have you watched in the last month? And it looks like, well, it looks like um, four in five have watched some. And wow, it looks like there's a lot. Our audience is obviously very into foreign content. 27% said six to ten. So... A lot of foreign content viewing going on, which is, I suppose, good news uh, for, for spirits. Yeah. And how often has something you were watching made you feel offended or uncomfortable? About just over half said none. Um, but that also means that there's 45% of the people have seen some stuff that's uh, upset them. Uh, I know I've seen a couple of things in the last month or so that... I was a little bit uncomfortable with. Um, but have you? Is, uh, although, of course, you say you don't watch TV yeah. that much. Well, it doesn't, 
but but even so in our business, you know, this is the first job I've had where I talk sex with my colleagues, you know, uh, and they can't get to HR. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> so I, I, I imagine that means that you end up watching some quite questionable content. Well, I don't, I don't watch it, but my, my teams do. And uh, I mean, there've been times, you know, where we've had to make sure people are okay, right? With some of the explicit violence or uh, rape scenes and things that are, yeah. the stuff is pretty dark now. And so it's, uh, it's not unlike, well, it actually is quite unlike YouTube and Facebook because they have, I mean, they're, they're completely, you know, you know, not uh, curated or if you will, but, but we still have some edge cases where there's pretty racy content. Yeah. I asked, where do you think AI ML will have the biggest impact in the video industry? Um, wow. Zero people said enhancing metadata. <laughs> I'd be surprised. Um, I know that's an area I'm expecting to see it have a big impact. Um, yeah. Improving recommendations and optimizing, optimizing content library definitely seems to be core usage uh, for AI and ML. Um, yeah. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually hearing it now being talked about a lot in backend services like optimizing in, co in video encoding, and in things like identifying people who are likely to cancel and areas like that. So, um, but it looks like yeah. our audience at least see it as recommendations and content library. Yeah. Are you surprised exactly. about the metadata thing? No, not at all. I mean, because we don't use it for metadata either, right? Because metadata gets localized, um, just, the, just the synopsis, really. But there's really no reason. There's no, there's no benefit from applying AI and ML for metadata. Uh, there is for the assets, of course, but not for metadata specifically. Yeah. And finally, I asked, which of the following do you think is the greatest foreign language film? Uh, and predictably, Seven Samurai came out well, actually, uh, well, hang out ahead, but also with Parasite, I guess that's some a movie that everybody's seen most recently. Right. And uh, come on, guys, if you haven't seen Le Cage au Fall or Babette's Feast, you've got to see them. Those are two of my absolute favorites. What about you, Teresa? I like Parasite. I would have chosen yeah. Parasite. That's a great show. You would? All right, very good. All right, well, Teresa, this has been tremendous. Thank you so much for spending time with us. And uh, perhaps we can have you, have you back in the future to talk about some of the interesting projects that you're, you're working on. Fantastic. Thank you, Colin, very much. It's Thank good you to so see. much. All right. Ned, back to you. Thank you, Colin. And, uh, Teresa, really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, Ned. Great to see you. And, and thank you to our audience. Uh, great, great, uh, great questions today. And I appreciate all the comments in the chat. Um, so, folks, for tomorrow, um, we are going to revisit the rise of NFTs. Of course, there's been a little dip since our last uh, rise of NFTs, but it is still uh, a topic worthy of discussion. So we are doing part five of our Rise of NFT series tomorrow with the founders of Recur. So join us at noon Pacific. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.